is with you, with uh, Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, what's he, what's he mean to a Nicholas Katzenbach? What's he mean? Yeah. Oh, I think Thurgood was the, the there were, you know, several really great black leaders, but none that was any more important, and certainly in the legal development, than Thurgood Marshall. And uh, also, I think Thurgood would say that Charles Houston was just, just as important, and may have, and, and may well have been. He was the, he was the fundamental architect of what the Legal Defense Fund was doing, and Thurgood, to a large extent, was carrying it out. He, Thurgood was bright, articulate, funny. Uh, and devoted. When did, when did your acquaintance with him begin? First time I met Thurgood was when he was nominated for the Court of Appeals in the Second Circuit. Okay. And I was called up by President Kennedy and he said to me, he said, the President said, Nick, he said, you see all those pictures in the paper of the hearings down there and you see Thurgood Marshall sitting next to Senator Javits, he said, I'm the person that nominated him for the bench, not Senator Javits. He said, I want you to pick up Thurgood and I want you to take him down there every day and I want you to be sure that it's not Javits that's, that is going to be in the pictures. So the next day I got picked up Thurgood and took him down to the hearing and, and uh, sat him down. Uh, next to me, I sat on the aisle, and he sat right next to me. And Senator Javits came in, sat on the other side, and immediately the cameramen came and started taking pictures. And I said, uh -uh, you know, I, they can cut me out if I'm on one side of Thurgood. So I got up and stood behind him, and between the two. The picture appeared the next day in the newspaper. It was Javits and Marshall. President called me up and said, where are you? I said, well, that's my necktie in the middle. <laughs> but I really got to know Thurgood much better when he was Solicitor General. Right. Did it become a personal friendship, or was it? Oh, I think, it, yes, I think it was a personal friendship. I, I, uh, I was very fond of him and Sissy, and, and their kids, okay. and uh, who have done very, very well, both of them. Mm -hmm. Did he reflect on Brown versus Board? Here it is, and, and this we're talking about the '60s here. Uh, even at that during that time period, uh, uh, strategies that were employed. The because uh, it's, it's still controversial how the NAACP sort of strategized that. Well, the the, the legal. There is controversy today about it. I mean, the, I, th I think they were absolutely right to go ahead and I think you had to get rid of Plessy. Plessy legitimized discrimination. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was necessarily what the court meant to do, but that, at that time, that was what everybody was doing, every white person at least. And, uh, and I think they had to get rid of it and uh, they went about it very carefully. You could have you could have made it increasingly painful, maybe impossible, under the separate but equal as far as schools were concerned. But I don't think the schools ever would have been equal anyhow. They would have built a brand new schoolhouse. In fact, I've had Southerners take me around, show me, say, I don't understand, look at the, that's the black schoolhouse there, look at it, it's much better than the white one. But the teachers, and that was sometimes occasionally true, but the teachers were not. In fact, that was one of the tragedies, it seems to me. I mean, they, they had a lot of black teachers teaching in black schools, and the black teachers really weren't qualified teachers. Mm -hmm. Was there a point during the, the Kennedy administration where the, the political pressure had sort of risen to a, the boiling point where it kind of said, now we've got to get into this, really got to mix it up? Well, it depends what you mean by political pressure. Uh, the the, the basic problem was uh, the one I indicated last night. You, you, you had no measure, no way of containing violence. Uh, 
except with armed forces. And if, and Burke Marshall was really the, I think the architect of, of what the Kennedy administration and what the Johnson administration did. I mean, uh, uh, whatever Burke's relationship with the Kennedys was, Marshall thought he was a, a I mean, Johnson thought that Burke Marshall was the best public servant he'd ever seen, and I think he may have been right. But Burke was the federalism had to work, and if federalism was going to work, then Southern sheriffs and police officers had to enforce the law in a constitutionally proper manner. And until they did so, you're going to have terrible problems. Their excuse was if there's a black march, how can we, con you know, we, we, we can't contain the violence that's there. But I mean, the response to that was that's your job. I mean, if the whites are going to march, blacks are entitled to march, and it's your job to contain it. Uh, but of course, it was far easier just to arrest the blacks from marching. So that was the problem, and, and I don't think there was any answer to it. Uh, I mean, the civil rights groups would unload on the FBI, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly, but it was never fair to think the FBI could maintain control. Couldn't. It's not a national police force. We don't have a national police force. So the only answer was, with the great dangers of violence, and the actual violence that occurred was to try to get legislation. And that was a very iffy proposition. And, and Kennedy, I think, took the earliest possible moment that he could have taken, probably reluctantly because he didn't have total confidence that he could get legislation through. There was no way you could have had total confidence because he knew he needed you could not get it with Democratic votes. Right. You had to have the Republican leadership. Right. The counterfactuals are obviously just speculative, but if Kennedy had lived, he would have been reelected. Could he accomplish something in the civil rights area before the 64 election? Could he, be, could he have accomplished something in the second term? Oh, yes. yes. Uh, but I don't think he could have accomplished more than, than Johnson did. Right. Uh, I mean, even Bobby, I remember going down to see Bobby once on another matter, and he was talking about Johnson, who certainly was not, he and Bobby Kennedy were always at odds, and he simply said, Bobby said, I cannot fault Lyndon Johnson on what is done on civil rights. And I think that was, is even true of the 64 Act. Uh, I think we, the 64 Act would have been enacted with Kennedy as president. That's always been my view, because we had the votes counted. We knew where they were. <coughs> but In roughly that same time period? Yeah. Okay. Uh, from the time you put it down. I mean, when the, when the, when the Act was drafted and went before the Congress, we had counted the votes. We knew what we had to do, and we knew where the key votes were. Uh, and uh, Lyndon Johnson, when Kennedy was killed, used the bill, uh, used Kennedy's assassination in part to try to help get votes for the bill. That was a, that was a good idea. And he said to Bobby, uh, it's your bill, and I will do whatever you ask me to do in support of it. Now, you could regard that as a very generous offer, or you could regard it as a very cynical offer. Right, right. Because if there was failure, it was Bobby's fault. Uh, and uh, so success as, Johnson's and it's a successful, well, it's, what was it President Kennedy said, you know, success has many, right. many, many fathers. Many fathers. <laughs> Uh, he became the point man in Mississippi, kind of the point man in Alabama, and actually he physically had to go down there. Yeah. I think the Alabama one was more intentional. The Mississippi one was kind of an accident. Mm -hmm. How so? I was, I was working one Sunday in the office when Bobby had, Bobby had been working on 
at Ole Miss uh, with Burke Marshall, and I had only been peripherally really involved in it. In the rather futile and sometimes in retrospect silly efforts with Barnett, who was the governor. Uh, <clears throat> one Sunday morning I was in there and then and Bobby, first thing Bobby said to me is I meant to be on Meet the Press this morning. I'm, I'm just tied up with this Mississippi thing. Will you go on and do it for me? I'll tell them. So I did. And I came back and I had some work to do and about 1 o'clock, 1.30, I went into his office and said, uh, said, I'm going home now. Anything you want me to do? He said, you got anything important on this afternoon? I said, no. He said, would you mind going down to Mississippi and taking charge of the thing down there? He said, we don't have any senior official down there. And he said, I think if things go wrong, we'll be heavily criticized if we don't have somebody down there who's senior. Then I can't go. Uh, he couldn't go. I mean, he would have started a riot just by being there. So I said, no, it's OK. I'll, I'll go. He said, I'll get a plane and take you. About then, my assistant, Harold Reese, stuck his head in the door. Bobby said, oh, Harold, he said, you got anything important on this afternoon? <laughs> And Harold said no, and Bobby said, well, how about you going with Nick down to Mississippi? So we did. We got a plane and went down there, and uh, it was a very, it was a, I don't know, I don't really know what we could have done. I've always thought it was a failure, but it was mostly, uh, at least I like to blame it on the university more than I do on anything else. I mean. We were down there, it became obvious as the kids were coming back, we had Colonel Birdsong and the Highway Patrol was there. and It was obvious, we had all these marshals with their helmets on and tear gas and so forth and big armbands. And it was obvious that they were very annoying to the, to the kids and even early on, I asked the university, can we use the gymnasium so I can put away these 300 marshals or 400 marshals, whatever I had. The university said no. I had no place to put them. Uh, we were in the Athenaeum building, which was a sacred building to them in the old Miss, and by the grove there. And uh, it probably was the most irritating place we could have picked, but I didn't know any better. I didn't know anything about old Miss. I don't think anybody did. And then we had the developments, and Colonel Birdson decided to pull out, and kids were throwing rocks and taunts and so forth and so on, and they got built up, and then they you know, let the marshals use tear gas. It was getting pretty bad. And uh, we didn't have any choice but to ask for the troops. It would never have happened if Colonel Birdsong had stuck, stayed there. And uh, we, they had a Senator Yarbrough was there. I talked with him, he was representing Governor Barnett, but a, a state senator, not a U.S. senator. But Barnett changed his mind every other hour, and so you never knew what he said. He had said this would not happen, Colonel Birdsong would maintain law and order. Yarber said that wasn't true. I said, call the governor. I have no idea what the governor said. <laughs> so then we had the military come in. They had enough troops come in down there to Oxford, Mississippi. They could have kept right on going, taking Cuba. <laughs> Was there any moment of physical danger for yourself? I suppose there must have been. I don't know. I wasn't particularly conscious of it. Uh, it was all kind of funny. I mean, I, we, we had a radio communication set up, which we had planned on in case there was problems to control the marshals. And the radio, the big radio, was set up in the basement of the courthouse. And then we had uh, another set, which was set up in the Athenaeum building, smaller, and then we had walkie-talkies. So we had communication throughout the area. Uh, and uh, we used that to know what was going on. 
to get permission to use tear gas and so forth, I put a dime in a payphone, it was only a dime then, and called the White House Collect and got the President and Bobby on the phone and maintained that throughout the whole time. It was, a, it was quite funny, really. It was an open line? Like open pay, line the whole time. Payphone collect. From payphone right collect to, to the White House, yep. <laughs> and, it's, and so we <laughs> knew what... Story. Chairman of MCI talking about this. We knew what was going <laughs> on. They didn't. Right. And the Army didn't. And of course, this made a lot of problems in the Army. President Kennedy would say to the Army, where are the troops? And the Army would say they're just now landing at Oxford, the airport there. And he would call me and say, are the troops there? And I'd call the guy at the airport on the walkie-talkie. He'd say, no troops around here. <laughs> so we'd go back. The president was just furious at the Army. And it really wasn't their fault. They had no communications at all. And they had misunderstood some of the instructions badly. I don't know how, I don't know. but. We had told them we didn't want loaded guns because if they had to be used, we wanted to come in without loaded guns because of fear that we thought we could control the marshals, but we didn't know about the army. But they had interpreted that as having no guns at all. So they were all standing around ready to go, but they had no guns, so they had to find guns for all, <laughs> for all the army and so forth. But the sequel to that story is Alabama. Uh, one day I was down in that old Miss and I was flying back from, uh, I forgot, was it Birmingham or whatever the airport was, and in a plane, and in an Air Force plane, and there was a major general there from the Signal Corps, and he asked, can I fly up with you to Washington? I said, sure. I said, what are you doing down here? And he said, I'm, he said, we had all these bad communications in there, and I'm trying to find out if we ever have to do it again, how to set up good communications. He, and I said, well, I said, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is find a payphone. <laughs> <laughs> but when we got the University of Alabama for that integration, the Army had set up a communication system independent of AT&T. If you picked up the phone, you could get Berlin. You could get any place in the world on an independent system if in case somehow or other at and system was destroyed. Mm -hmm. They built a huge tower. I think they must have spent millions of dollars to set up a communication system which we never used. Talk to me about that other picture that's in the program. This is the George Wallace um, Confrontation, yeah. if you will. Yeah. What, can you set that up and set the scene up for us and, and kind of what happened? There? Well, we never had any communication with Wallace at all uh, until immediately prior to the time we knew we knew what he was going to do. He said he was going to stand in the schoolhouse door, <clears throat> and, and so we knew he was going to stand in the schoolhouse door. Uh, the problem, and we knew also that he was going to refuse admission at that time, and we knew we were going to have to get troops. The problem was that the local, we wanted to do it by bringing the no, local National Guard into federal service, but there were only about 450 guardsmen in that area. And President Kennedy was very concerned that that wasn't enough to maintain order if there was, if like an old Miss, people came pouring in with guns. I think in fairness, we knew that Wallace himself did not want violence. He said so frequently, and there was no reason to disbelieve him. In fact, I think, I think Barnett had been badly hurt by the riot in Mississippi, and I don't think Wallace or any other governor would want a similar riot. The problem we faced was whether or not he could control it. Mm -hmm. 
so, because he was going to leave it to the federal troops, to, he didn't want to control, he didn't want his own troops telling him what to do, obviously, nor would they have, and he had about 600 there. So that was the sort of technical problem that we faced, and Kennedy, President Kennedy was absolutely determined that the two students be admitted that day to the university, that we not wait overnight. He didn't want, the, he didn't want all the press and television of saying that Wallace had succeeded. So that was the problem we had. I was sent down there with <clears throat> uh, General Creighton Abrams, who had been in charge of this before and had caught hell unfairly from the president for the Ole Miss thing. And uh, he was later the commander in Vietnam. The very Abrams tank is named after him. He was a very, very uh, fine army officer. I asked him to take as few people as possible. He took two other officers with him, a lieutenant colonel and a major. One from the reserve was in charge of the army part of the reserve and part of it, and the other was a, from the advocate general's office. So we spent that night, the, that the representatives of the governor came over and told us where we should enter the campus and where the door was going to be and what we should, that where we should do this, that, and the other thing, all of which was pretty distasteful, but I don't know what else we could do. We really weren't going to confront them in any other way. And uh, we spent the evening, the president at one time wanted to bring the troops into federal service immediately so he'd have enough. And I was arguing, you don't have the authority to do that. There's, been, there's no authority for federalizing the troops. The legal authority for doing that is if the governor of a state or the, is unable or unwilling to maintain law and order. Well, you could have made an argument he might be unwilling. He'd said he wasn't going to admit them, but he had never done anything. Mm -hmm. So I finally convinced the people in Washington, the president and so forth, that we could do it. With Abrams was sure that we could do it. There'd be no problem. We also, at the last minute, made some different arrangements. I got the uh, keys to the students' dormitories from Frank Rose, the president, who was, who was very sympathetic throughout and very helpful throughout. Quite a contrast to the University of Mississippi. And uh, also got agreement that I would be there without the two students. Said there's no reason why Vivian Malone and Jimmy Hood have to be turned down and turn me down. So uh, I went up that night to talk with Vivian in Birmingham and then drove down the next day. And uh, going down, I had a radio in the car and said the Attorney General wanted to talk to me. So uh, I went and stopped at a shopping center and put a dime in the phone again, called him. Full of dimes. <laughs> yeah, and collect. Okay. So one dime. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said two things. He said the president has a proclamation he wants to give to the governor, which I thought was totally unnecessary. But if he wanted a proclamation, that's fine. I said as long as you can get it to me, which they he told me how to, they'd get it to me. And then he said, what are you going to say to the governor? I said, I don't know. I haven't written anything out. I, I don't know. He said, well, the president wants you to make him look foolish. <laughs> I said, have you got any idea how to do that? <laughs> he says, oh, he said, you'll do fine. <laughs> <laughs> so we then proceeded through this thing that 
Well, the TV and newspaper people wanted to wire me up for sound, and I refused. The governor, when I came up there, the governor appeared, and he had wires sticking out of every pocket. And uh, he stood in the shade and put me in the sun, which irritated me. And we proceeded to go through that charade. What was the charade? Well, everybody knew what was going to happen. Right. We didn't have to communicate with the governor. He knew perfectly well when he'd had his day in the sun, or out of it, yep. <laughs> he, uh, that we were going to federalize the troops and he'd have to get out of there. He knew that. Right. We, he knew the students were going to be admitted. And that's why I say it was a charade. I mean, we had talked. We didn't have to go through that. From a matter of law, we could regard the students as, re as registered. The court had ordered them registered. We could have treated that as done. Right. Simply sent them to class. I, in fact, I even suggested that to Bobby, and he said no. He said, I think that would cause violence. Right. We've got to give the governor his confrontation with and so forth. So, so he we actually did. Make, you come up down the, the, the walkway. He's in the doorway. And he's behind the podium, but as I recall, he gives us sort of a speech. He walked out from behind. Okay. Came up to the podium. I walked up there with the uh, United States Marshal for Alabama, Northern Alabama, and U.S. Attorney for Northern Alabama, both of whom wanted to go with me, which was very courageous on their part. They're living down there. Uh, in fact, the Marshal was kind of irritated that I was there at all. He thought it was his job. And uh, he wanted to do it. He's a very nice man who was dying from cancer at the time. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he thought this might be his last big act. But I said, no, he, he couldn't do that, but he could come with me, and, right. which he did. He's, he's in most of the pictures. So after, after he'd said that, I picked up Vivian Malone in the, her car, and John Doerr took Jimmy Hood, I took her to the dormitory, which was... Did you was, say anything there? Was there any... Wallace gave a speech. Did oh, I said a lot, yeah. I don't know what I said. I just... I was trying to carry out Bobby's instructions. <laughs> was there a proclamation that you handed to him? Yeah, I handed him a proclamation. I don't think he read it, and I don't think it was relevant to anything that I could figure out. <laughs> but uh, I think the president wanted to show that he, he was involved. And uh, wasn't just his brother; it was it was the whole government. Right. And I suppose it did serve that purpose. I don't mean to poo-poo it, but it wasn't wasn't going to make any difference to anybody other than the president. And you took the students. Took the students. I had to go right through their police line to do it. They didn't know what to make of it. They didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> we just walked right through to her dormitory, then they began to realize what we were doing. They did, they did not. Frank Rose had not told them that this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we went in, the house mother came down and said, oh, you must be Vivian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then Vivian went up with her to her room. I said, come down and eat in the cafeteria right away. But we had had a lot of problems at Ole Miss with Meredith in the cafeteria, and I didn't want that to happen again. I got a phone call from Frank Rose, who said that was a terrible idea. This could cause trouble, and I was fairly adamant. I said, "Look, if it's going to cause trouble, it might as well cause trouble right now. No point in letting things build up by not doing it." So Vivian is a wonderful person and great personality for that. Came down, went in, it was a cafeteria style. She got her meal and sat down. And a couple of other girls there came over and sat down with her. It was quite surprising. And you were there too? I mean, you were oh, I was outside. I wasn't going to go near her. Okay. Yeah. I had to be Vivian all by herself. I was not prepared to have an education of the expense of that with Meredith, with a thousand troops around all day. Now, James Hood? 
He was down at the other dormitory with John Doerr, mm -hmm. and I, who was the the uh, first assistant in, at the uh, in the civil rights division and the biggest litigator in the of the government in the South. And so we went back to I went back to headquarters and we had, which was in the National Guard building, and and uh, waited for the troops. And I remember Abrams was there. We'd been up all night. Abrams was there in a seersucker suit that he'd slept in. <laughs> his two the major lieutenant colonel came in and said, we have to notify uh, General, I've forgotten his name, I'll think of it in a minute. But he said, I suppose this will be uniform. And Abrams chewed on his cigar and said, ah, he said, he knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> so we went, and then the general said the governor wanted to say a few words, which I didn't want. Abram said, would that be all right? And I said, if he keeps it under one minute. So they went through that. The, the uh, Alabama general annoyed me because he said it was his sad duty, which annoyed me. But the governor said he was yielding to the superior force of the federal government and drove off, and that was that. The next morning, the, at the other part of the university in, in uh, oh, where it's where the uh, space station is, uh, Huntsville. Huntsville right. We had a student go in there with unescorted and register. Did you ever expect 40 years later that particular picture would get uh, so much? Hmm. Not really, no. no. It speaks a million it's, words. It's been around, yeah. Well, it's a familiar picture, yeah. It's a funny group. Standing over right next to one of their policemen is Joe Dolan, who was one of my deputies. <laughs> later was the administrative assistant to Bobby in the Senate. And he looks as though he's on their side, <laughs> which he certainly wasn't. <laughs> Subsequently, during the Johnson uh, administration, Johnson uh, administration, he had a, the president had a chance to bring Wallace to the White House. Mm -hmm. were, were you part of that orchestration of that? Yeah, that was. Wallace came up on a Saturday morning. There was a lot of demonstrations going on. Uh, at that time, uh, it was really pre-Vietnam demonstrations. These were civil rights demonstrations, wanting more action because of the still hadn't solved the problems with the '64 Act. I went over to the president's office with Burke Marshall, and uh, remember the president said to me, he said. Uh, he said, write out six things I can ask Wallace to do. I said, well, what kind of things? He said, I don't care. They can be anything. Be as outrageous as you want. I don't care. So I wrote out six things for him. And, and they were pretty outrageous. Uh, I didn't know what he was going to do with them, but they sat down. Wallace came in. President Johnson was his charming self, you know, threw his arm around Wallace, George, how are you? And then he called his Secret Service guy, whose name I've forgotten, who came from Alabama. And he said, come over here and meet your governor. You know, <laughs> this guy gave Wallace this royal treatment. And then sat him down. And, and uh, Wallace was there with the idea, I think, that with all these demonstrations and so forth, the president might be more amenable to slowing things down which was a bad mistake. He certainly wasn't. And I can't remember all the things that he asked him, but I, I remember one, he said, uh, he said, George, he said, you see all those demonstrators out there demonstrating? Oh, yes, Mr. President, I see them. They're all demonstrating about these civil rights matters. Oh, yes, Mr. President. He said, you know, he said, George, why don't you and I go out? You see all those cameras out there? Yeah. Why don't you and I go out? on those cameras. He said, we could stop those demonstrations. 
Oh, how can we do that, Mr. President? Well, he said, you and I go out there and you just announce that you've decided to desegregate every school in Alabama. <laughs> Wallace went pale. <laughs> he said, Mr. President, he said, I can't do that. I don't run the schools in Alabama. Johnson said, George, no shit me. You run everything in Alabama. <laughs> and, uh, and Wallace was really quite shaken by it. Uh, and then this is the kind of thing Lyndon Johnson did so well. He said, George, how do you think I'm doing in Vietnam? And he just switched it over so that George could praise him and they could have agreement. Then he went back to something else on civil rights. And it all ended up with all those television cameras sitting out there and Wallace went out the back door <laughs> to avoid the cameras. I think he had planned on some great statement about this, but he wasn't going to make it. Yeah. And I went out with the, the president to the cameras and he, President, used it and said he was going to send down the Voting Rights Act on Monday. And uh, he said, I got the Attorney General here. He's going to brief you on that act. And I said, Mr. President, this is meant to be off the record. He said, that's right, on camera. This is all off the record. <laughs> he said, turn off those cameras. <laughs> and he became Cecil B. DeMille directing all these cameras, you know. And of course, it's perfectly obvious <laughs> when the reports came out the next day <laughs> who was briefing the president, <laughs> who was briefing the press. <laughs> That's funny. But, Johnson. Did, how do you characterize him? He, he really was a, a complicated man, wasn't he? He's a very complicated man, and he was a marvelous politician. Uh, it was always very hard to know what he believed in. And he used to say an awful lot of things that just weren't true. Uh, and I used to worry about that. And I finally came to the conclusion that most of the time he didn't know they weren't true. He just had, he had rearranged everything so that it fitted what he wanted. Uh, the fact that it wasn't true was not important. Uh, I don't mean it was lying about some corrupt thing. They were just funny little things. I, I mean, he said to me once and to a professor at Harvard uh, who used to write on presidential politics, and he said what he wanted to do, he said it's, it's terrible to have this two-year term for congressman. He said, I want to get a four-year term for congressman. He said, I want to put that in my State of the Union message, and I want you to write me a memo and tell me how to do that. I said, I don't think that's a good idea. And he said, well, you write me a memo about that. And so I tried to figure out a way to do this. And he said, had said the same thing to uh, a professor at Harvard. It's with an N. Neustadt. What? Neustadt. Neustadt. Dick Neustadt. And Neustadt took the same view that I took and said it was a terrible idea. I wrote him a memo said it was a bad idea. said, if you're going to do it, the only way that I can think of to do it is to stagger the terms so that you've got half the congressmen being elected in the off year and half of them being elected in the presidential year. Something like that. Well, he gave, he put it in his speech to the State of the Union. Got enormous cheers from all the congressmen who hadn't thought about it and thought, my God, would." get four years instead of two, that's good. And then they thought about it, of course it wasn't. Well, within two or three months, Johnson was telling everybody that he knew. He didn't know why he had done this crazy thing, except that these two professors <laughs> had urged it on him, and he'd succumbed to their urgings. And I do believe he believed that. Oh yeah, there's disappointments, I guess. The, uh, well, I told you one, I, th I th think if I had been better prepared, I could have done a better job at Ole Miss. There might not have been a riot. Uh,
last time you guys were here and talked about this case, I believe, at the Chautauqua Institution. Um, it was, it's been said, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Jackson had some mis uh, Justice Jackson had some misgivings about the whole process at first. Can you explain to me what he went through during, during this case? And if he had that sense that maybe he was a little uncomfortable with the idea of the laws of the country and getting ahead of what the general feeling of the public was regarding this case. He was someone who believed very strongly in the rule of law and that you didn't do things uh, by over the dictum. You didn't, you didn't just direct people to do things without giving a sensible reason grounded in the law. And he was having trouble from the beginning, particularly when Vincent was alive, in hearing the articulation of any theory that made a whole lot of sense to him, um, other than the fact that he knew within himself that the time had come, probably long since come, uh, for segregation solely on the basis of race to be struck down. I mean, he knew that. But what he was wrestling with was, what, how do we say this? How do we even come to grips with it ourselves in, in making it sound as if it is in fact grounded in the law rather than just a change of heart on the part of nine men? Um, he was also concerned, I think, from discussions at the conferences, or perhaps with individual justices, that the court was going to be looking for a scapegoat here and saying that people had misperceived or people had done the wrong thing or they hadn't paid attention to the law and so forth. And he uh, knew, uh, being the good lawyer that he was, that they hadn't misperceived anything. They'd done exactly what the Supreme Court had told them that they could do. Uh, segregate on the basis of race so long as the facilities are sufficiently equal. And uh, he was also concerned, uh, as you know from his concurring opinion, about simply turning all of this back to poor district judges living down there with their neighbors in the deep south who could even be in harm's way and who could not say I'm merely doing what the Supreme Court told me to do when, when the Supreme Court was not telling them to do anything except use your good judgment. Those were the kinds of things that were giving him pause. Um, and I, as, as I said in my speech when I was here last, I think one of the great feelings he had when he read Earl Warren, Warren's opinion was relief that Earl Warren A was not doing some of the things he was afraid of, uh, certainly was not faulting, for example, anybody. And secondly, that while it was not grounded in the premises that Jackson had been prepared to adopt, it did make enough sense. It was something that even the man in the street could understand, that if you take children and separate them forcibly solely because of their race, that you are saying that the races are unequal and guess who is inferior? And in that day and age, 1954, you couldn't do that any longer. You shouldn't have been doing it before, but you certainly couldn't do it then. Do you think he had a sense of what was to come in the 60s? I'm sorry? Do you think he had a sense of what was to come? I mean, he died in 54, but do you think he had a sense of what was coming in the 60s, some of what the country was wrestling with as far as the civil rights movement? I think he would have had a pretty good guess that it was going to be about as difficult as it has been, that it would be successful in some places, be done very quickly, harmoniously. In other places, it would be done, but it would be difficult and create a lot of hard feelings. And then in a third set of places, it wouldn't be done at all. I, I, he, he was so practical. He, he, he was a very practical man. He was not a dreamer. Uh, uh, he, although, as you know from his language, he had 
a wonderful way of expressing things in, in, in a way that appealed to people. But I, I mean, he was not a social scientist. Uh, he, was a, he thought first, what is actually going to happen here? What is best for everybody? What should happen? And so forth. So uh, my guess is that he would not have been surprised. He, he knew that the decree, the decree was very important to him. It had bothered him from the beginning. It, so, okay, we can say that it's the end of segregation, but then what do we do? And what, what do we tell the judges to do? He was very worried about that. And I think that he was um, trying not to worry about the case because of his health, but at the same time, he was worried about that particular aspect. And had been thinking all along about what form the decree should take. But as I say, we weren't able to get together very much. Now, several times I went out to his house to work on opinions, uh, where it's a house where Jack Kennedy subsequently lived and Ethel and Bobby Kennedy lived and Ethel still lives, although I understand she's trying to sell it. But, um, but I don't think it was during that period um, between the decision and the time he died. I, I don't think I went out there because he was sick. I remember him being quite well when I went out there, so I don't think I did. I'm going to turn off this. You were, you stayed on after Jackson died, you, you stayed on and worked for John Marshall Harlan. Well, I worked with Frankfurter first. Yeah, okay. And, and you were asked by the Chief Justice to participate in the research for what would turn out to be Brown II. In doing the research and in being part of the clerk process, did, did you get any feeling that you were maybe carrying, continuing to carry a torch of Justice Jackson as the Brown II order was being implemented? Did you get did you feel any burden there at all? From well, I was doing two things. Uh, number one, for all of the justices, I was part of that pool that was doing research into various things totally outside the record. I mean, it was, it was an interesting process that people have not commented upon very much. But uh, my particular job was to see if I could get together maps of cities that showed where uh, black and white people lived and where their schools were and and what kind of school systems they had. So so as to see as a practical matter what we were dealing with uh, in saying, hey, you've got to integrate the schools. Um, the other part that I was doing was trying to, I had constant contact with Justice Harlan, who wanted everything he could get his hands on in regard to these cases. And he had asked me for a memo on what I thought uh, the decree should look like. And what I concluded by then was that the, the school systems were far, far more complex than I had anticipated. I just thought that you went to the school nearest to where you lived and that was the end of it. But there were all kinds of systems in place throughout the country for um, establishing where people would go to school. And I didn't understand how we could come up with a decree that would cover all of these situations. And um, But I did write a memo making rather extensive recommendations about what the decree might look like. So those were the two parts that I was working on more or less at the same time. Would Jackson have been happy the way the order ultimately came out in Brown versus Well, I think he foresaw a lot of what I found, and that was that it was a far more complex factual situation than the people on the court uh, had assumed, uh, or in effect were assuming when they said, okay, it's unconstitutional. Um, and as you know from his various drafts of his concurring opinion, he was very upset about what they actually ultimately did, and that was to turn it back to the district courts without much 
um, guidance as to how they were per to proceed. Uh, he thought that that was unfair to the district judges. Um, on the other hand, I had mixed emotions about it because while I agreed with him that that had an element of unfairness in it, I also saw all the complexities of the systems and wondered how in the world, if the court was going to tell them how to do it, what, what in the world would it say that would meet all of these disparate systems? So I was, I was pretty torn. <laughs> After you left justices, in Brown versus Two, uh, and the use of the all deliberate speed, and I understand that that again, that even the terminology as it was used has a whole life of its own. Uh, even that ca that case was unanimous. Did you get a sense that there was fatigue on the court at that point? That there was really no particular direction. You know, I've never studied. Um at all and done any original research on why the court did that. Yeah, I think probably you could, there was fatigue. There was very definitely a strong sense on the part of the court that to establish a firm deadline for compliance, which is what Marshall wanted, he would have liked to have had desegregation go into effect starting with the school year 56-57. Uh, the, the Brown II was issued in May of 55. It would have given them another year. Um, but uh, the court was just very aware of the opposition that this would whip up, and they shied away from it. Uh, well, as I said in the talk, he and Frankfurt in particular were very worried about judges making social policies. And they thought that legislatures or the Congress should do it, elected people. They obviously weren't going to do it, and uh, I'm convinced that even if the court, court had tried to decide the case in 1953, after its first hearing in December of 52, they didn't, they postponed it. I believe that um, Jackson would have joined a majority of around six, mm -hmm. six to three, at that time in favor of uh, desegregating the schools. I guess a couple of the people said to me this morning that this session was very interesting to them, not only because of the Brown case, but because it's one of the few occasions where people get a sense of how things work at the Supreme Court. Absolutely. So you might want to do something similar uh, more on that theme or maybe make use of this, but not in the, not focusing it uh, on Brown exclusively, but also on the inner workings of the Supreme Court. And I guess you'd have to say in the 50s, because it might be somewhat different now. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly decisions are given in different days and uh, more law clerks in the picture. Today was such, like, kind of like you open up a window of a unique period of time, 1953 to 54, and we all were sitting out there peering in yeah. and watching something unfold, and obviously with a theme of Brown. Yeah, Walking well, and that may be a good way to do it, yeah. I mean, on second thought. If you just got a bunch of law clerks to interact, uh, it might not be as productive as this was because there was this, we were all looking at the same picture and that's when you get discriminating differences. Um, and I think this is an unusual group. Um, I mean, I hadn't seen, uh, I saw Barrett once maybe about 20 years ago, the others I hadn't seen for 50 years, but uh, there was a lot. Any opportunity, or should there even be an opportunity, to celebrate Brown II as far as an event of significance? This was the actual decree itself. Uh, obviously, celebrating the decision with a great uh, deal of, of 
show. Does Brown two raise to some level of stopping and recognizing that? I don't think it rises to the same level because there's so much disagreement, whether justified or not, as to the propriety of the all deliberate speed approach on implementation. I think as uh, some of us indicated in the uh, earlier conversation, without that uh, undertaking on a uh, gradual basis outlined in uh, Brown 2, I don't think you would have had Brown 1, or at least you wouldn't have had Brown 1 on uh, a unanimous basis with no concurring or dissenting opinions to be, I guess, brutal about it. You might say that Brown 2 is a price you had to pay for Brown 1. Mm -hmm. 